Okay. Good morning again. This is Tina Pettengill from the Maine Public Health Association. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for our second webinar in the series titled Tele Telehealth and Public Health Improving Access for Rural Populations in Maine. <clears throat> we are very excited to be able to host um, such a progressive thinking and forward thinking type of webinar this morning and I think I'm probably as excited as anyone else to be to hear what Danielle and Andrew have to say this morning. Um, I just want to welcome everyone, say a couple of words about the logistics around the webinar and then uh, we'll get started. Um, we just to let everyone know we are recording this webinar. Uh, everyone will be muted for the time being until the very end of the webinar. That doesn't preclude you from answering any questions. You'll see in your, um, your, your, on your screen there from GoToWebinar, you have a questions box and you're welcome to ask questions anytime throughout the webinar. Just type it into that little chat box. We will see those. Um, we will likely hold the questions until the end. But as Andrew and Danielle see those questions, they may decide to answer them throughout the webinar as well. Um, but we want folks to know this can be interactive. Just answer, ask your question anytime. At the end, also, we will unmute people who have their hands raised, and we will be able to answer questions live and in person that way as well. Um, so thanks again for joining us. Um, again, my name is Tina Pettengill from the Maine Public Health Association. We're uh, very proud and excited to have a webinar featuring, featuring telehealth. I'm wondering if this is kind of our the next frontier for public health, especially in a um, state like Maine that is so rural and so spread out. Um, so we're going to hear a little bit more about that today, and we are um, really excited to have two experts from the field right here in Maine being able to tell us about <clears throat> more about te telehealth and how it interfaces with public health. Um, our two presenters today are Danielle Lauder and Andrew Solomon. Danielle is the Program Manager for M Medical Care Development Public Health Technology Supported Initiatives, where she directs the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center. <clears throat> Danielle has extensive experiences in developing, implementing, and evaluating programs focused on increasing access and enhancing quality of care in Maine and beyond, including innovative telehealth programs. And Andrew is the project manager for the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center, where he assists organizations in developing, expanding telehealth programs. He tracks and researches telehealth reimbursement, legal and regulatory issues, model programs, telehealth technology and other topics. <clears throat> so again, we're, I feel like we're so fortunate to have Danielle and Andrew not only here with us today, but here working in Maine um, on programs and practices that I think are, are really going to be um, potentially the wave of the future. So um, Danielle, I'm going to turn this webcam off, thankfully, <laughs> um, and let you and Andrew take it away. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much, Tina. And just to confirm that you can hear us okay? Yes. Excellent. And then I'll just do another brief test to make sure that you can see when our slides are advancing. It looks great. Perfect. So that's excellent. Hopefully everybody else can see that okay as well. So we just wanted to say hello and get everybody a little bit more comfortable with using their webcams. It's sort of a a trick that we use when we meet with folks, and it really does uh, make a difference when you're when you have a lot of meetings. We work across eight states, so we have a lot of meetings uh, via televideo. So it's really nice to see faces. We are going to shut our camera off as well because I happen to be a hand talker, and you don't, you all don't want to see that. So, <laughs> but just wanted to say good morning and thank you so much for joining us, and thank you so much for having us, Tina. We really appreciate the opportunity, and really look forward to working with Maine Public Health Association and your stakeholders and members um, who provide such meaningful services, many of which I have had the, the privilege to take part in over the years. And um, so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and, and get rid of my video. And we will jump right in. We have about 40 minutes of slide presentation for you here and wanted to make sure that we leave plenty of opportunity at the end uh, for your questions. And we will kind of keep track during the presentation in regard to those questions coming in and make sure that we 
uh, answer them all at the end. And if we don't know the answer, uh, which sometimes we don't, we certainly know where we can go to get the information. So um, much looking forward to chatting with you today, but also um, developing a meaningful relationship moving forward and, and happy to provide technical assistance well above and beyond um, the webinar here today. So we will hop right in. Tina, thank you very much for the great intro. And just a little bit about our organization, the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center is um, based out of MCD Public Health. Hopefully many of you have heard of us. Um, we are a public health institute and, and part of the um, National Network of Public Health Institutes and have been for many years. We have a great team here uh, focused on development of uh, public health programs, evaluation, et cetera. Um, across across uh, many different uh, programs, preventative uh, treatment, uh, quality improvement, uh, technology most certainly, um, and, and medical care development of course has been around since about 1966 and we have multiple divisions who uh, do meaningful work throughout um, Maine and the nation and, and as well as our international division who does some phenomenal work. Um, and then our clinical partner, for the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center is the University of Vermont's Medical Center, where we have a great team there. Our, our PI for Netric is Dr. Terry Rabinowitz, and he is their telemedicine director and also um, has provided many years of telepsychiatry services to folks in his region and beyond and, and is an expert in the field and, and um, just a huge asset to our team. And we have um, some folks who also provide um, IT and video conferencing, et cetera, in regards to nuts and bolts of developing uh, the technology pieces and HIT pieces in regard to telehealth programs. Uh, and we also have a wonderful colleague at the Regional Medical Center at Lubeck, Dr. Michael Edwards, who um, is a fantastic resource in, in regard to research and evaluation and that we tap uh, very often. So that's sort of the, the tripod of our team, um, if you will. So if you're not really familiar with the telehealth resource centers. There are 14 of us all around the United States. We are all funded through HRSA's Office for Advancement of Telehealth. And as you can see by this map, uh, there are 12 regional telehealth resource centers who really focus on regional efforts. Although we would say, you know, if somebody from Washington State asks us a telehealth question, we'll most usually refer them um, to their telehealth resource center, but if they're particular expertise or we have a resource, uh, we would never turn somebody away. Um, there's always uh, room uh, to accept new technical assistance requests, et cetera. But our, our goal really and our mission through HRSA is to provide telehealth um, technical assistance, meeting people where they're at, whether you're just learning what telehealth is or whether you are an established program and you want to evaluate your program or you want to collaborate with somebody to research it. We all know and you all know as Maine Public Health Association members that getting hold of enough data in the state of Maine and really within our region and any rural state is often um, very troublesome or, or it's, it's a challenge that we all struggle to overcome. And so having access to all of these other telehealth resource centers, and you can see how they're broken up throughout the United States, um, is really helpful and important and that's something that we tap into often. And then I really want to mention to uh, our two specialty telehealth resource centers, we have uh, the um, Telehealth Technology Assessment Center, which is located out of Alaska, and they really are focused on um, looking at the plethora of uh, technology that comes out every day. Uh, it's almost overwhelming at times in the telehealth arena. You can imagine how that would be true with folks um, who don't work in this field. And, so they really, in an, a very objective way, because we're all federally funded, look at the various um, video conferencing, all the different pieces of technology. mHealth is a big thing. We're going to share a little bit about that today in our examples. Um, but they really objectively test that equipment, that software, and they, they provide objective feedback on um, what most what might best fit your program. So they're a great asset. And then the Center for Connected Health Policy, or CCHP, is located out of Sacramento, California, and they are a huge asset. They are primarily focused on policy, as their name would suggest, and are a, an excellent um, partner in crime. We, we lean on them quite often uh, in regard to policy. Policy in regard to telehealth, if you know one state's policy, you know one state's policies, policy. So it can be um, daunting to keep up with it and to interpret 
the, the various laws and bills that are out there uh, most accurately. So we lean on the CCHP folks um, quite often to help us through that. So who do we serve? I guess the question is probably better, who don't we serve? This is a list um, that's probably most typical uh, folks that we hear from, but it certainly does not include everyone. Um, we are working more and more upstream with academic institutions. One of our goals is really to implement um, telehealth training that helps our uh, providers to come out ready to, to utilize the technology versus having to add that one more thing on their plate. So that's something that we're really uh, focused on and we love to work with partners in that way. Um, federal, state, regional, local governmental agencies, we work, we work with a lot of our offices of rural health across the eight states that uh, Metric covers. And we do we cover all of the New England states, all of New York State, and half of New Jersey, which we um, split up with the Mid Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center. So it's a large region. Um, we work with legislators and policymakers. There's a lot of telehealth policy out there right now. Um, health systems, rural clinics, FQHCs, or federal federally qualified health centers. Um, most certainly, a lot of rural entities, schools, vendors. Um, many others. I guess our point here is that the sky's the limit in um, more and more public health folks are reaching out in regard to how they can use telehealth services, um, whether it's continuing, you know, education, distance learning, etc., um, or implementation of programs. So we're excited to hear from you all uh, on how you think we can help um, with your telehealth efforts. What do we provide uh, for technical assistance? Again, this kind of runs the gamut. Uh, we might, someone might come up with a question that we've never heard before, but you can bet um, that we're going to try to find the answer for you. Uh, but typically, short and longer term technical assistance services for organizations, and again, that's kind of meeting them where they're at, depending on whether they're just getting started. We might do a technology assessment across their organization or a group of organizations. If that's something that we typically typically do, or there are a lot of resources out there, please don't recreate the wheel if somebody's looking for a template, a protocol, et cetera, a policy in regard to telehealth, chances are it's out there and we can get our hands on it, so please do reach out in that way. Um, education for the telehealth workforce, uh, we had, I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Access to educational materials, specialized tools, uh, access to telehealth experts, again, um, we have folks throughout all of the other telehealth resource centers who have very close connections with providers who have had uh, programs in place for a very long time or that maybe they're just starting out and they want to um, connect with somebody and, and work collaboratively and share research, data, et cetera. Uh, monthly newsletter updates. If you're not on our newsletter list and you want to be, please reach out. We would love to add you. Um, it's, a, it's a great newsletter. Support for collaboration that fosters a favorable environment for telehealth, absolutely helping change environment, getting, um, in, like many of you, if you want to change something, you know you need to get uh, leadership support and, and build it out, so it's much the same with telehealth. And that really is just the tip of the iceberg. We're going to share a little bit more about each, you know, some of these things with you today, but certainly we could go, this could, we've done a whole day training on some of these things, so <laughs> we're going to zip through uh, a lot of this and please follow up with us for more information. But uh, reimbursement is a, a big topic of interest. Um, program development, strategic planning, how do you use your local data to best, in, you know, inform and prioritize limited resources that you're putting into telehealth. Uh, licensing and credentialing, malpractice, uh, regulations and other legal considerations, internet prescribing is, is becoming more and more of interest, uh, technology selection with all the, the tech that's out there, security, privacy, HIPAA, we know that's a huge concern, uh, workforce development, program evaluation, and more. <laughs> Just a couple of resources that we wanted to make sure we mention. Of course, we have others, and we would encourage you to go to our website and check some of these out. Um, our telehealth resource library is just at netric.org, netrc.org. Um, we have nearly 1,200 publicly available resources. I, I mentioned Dr. Michael Edwards out of Regional Medical Center at Lubeck. He really is the impetus behind this and, and does such a fantastic job compiling these, and he really his, puts his effort in finding things that are fully available for folks without having to pay for a long-term subscription. So uh, you will find some abstracts, but most of them are full articles that you can really um, dig into and, and find results, et cetera, from, um, outcomes from those studies. 
find telehealth providers is um, a mapping tool that we worked with the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center. They developed it along with a vendor. Um, and, and basically, the, the purpose of find telehealth providers is to map out um, folks within our region. So it covers our all eight states that we work in, and then, of course, all of the Mid-Atlantic states as well is to map those telehealth providers so that folks can see where they're located and whether you're uh, a healthcare entity and you're looking to um, gain access to some, some healthcare services that you don't currently have because of healthcare shortage, um, that kind of thing, or whether you're on the opposite end of that and you are an entity that is looking to provide telehealth services. Either way, if you're an individual, you can access this website. And you know, if you're looking for um, in public health realm, I could see it being useful. If, you know, if, if your stakeholders are looking for organizations and or providers who use telehealth, that you could look on the map and say, oh, okay, well, they provide telecardiology, for example, out of um, Eastern Maine Medical Center. And then you could um, share that information with colleagues. There's the telehealth basics curriculum that we developed with the Veterans Rural Health uh, Resource Center, the Eastern Region, as training, again, working upstream for telepresenters. It's a, it's a great skill to have. And you, as you start to use it more and, and you get more practice, we know that it's just really important to uh, put that best foot forward. Technology is new to some folks, although we know that uh, it's usually a harder sell to providers than it is to the patients. Um, but it's really important that you feel comfortable on screen and that, you're, um, that, that that encounter is just as meaningful and, and productive and, and high quality as it would be in person. So that's you know, the great thing about telepresenting and training. Uh, personalized toolkits. We are available to create toolkits with resources for your needs. Again, you know, we often get similar questions. But as you know, each organization is different. They work differently. So we really try hard, again, to meet folks where they're at and create resources that are most meaningful uh, based on their current needs and resources and gaps. So with that uh, very um, big overview, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew. All right. Thank, thank you, Danielle. So the next series of slides will be the introduction to telehealth. And some of this is very basic, which can be very good for some of our audiences. But then we also recognize that some folks may know a lot of this already. So I'll try and get through these as quickly as possible uh, to save as much time as possible, but I think it's important to cover. If you've seen a telehealth presentation before, it's very likely that you've seen this slide in their presentation. But I think it's so cool, and I think it's important to include. This is from a magazine uh, printed in 1925, the Science and Invention magazine. And the author predicted in the magazine this device he called the teledactyl a future instrument by which it will be possible for us to feel at a distance. And he thought that radio technology would allow a provider not only to see a patient at home by television, but radio would allow the provider in this image to manipulate those controls, which would then move at the patient side, and the provider could provide care at a distance using radio technology. And the author actually said that this idea is not at all impossible where the instrument can be built today with means available right now. And I think it's really neat to think that this person thought we could build this in 1925. He predicted that this would be common by 1975, and we know that's not true. But certainly we're getting there, and we're very close. So what is telehealth? A very basic definition. It's a collection of means or methods for enhancing public health or health care or health education using telecommunications technologies. And there's a lot of different options there. It's a very broad topic, and we try and encompass as much as we can. These are two definitions from Maine law. The top one is from a statute passed in 2009, and it describes telemedicine as the use of interactive audio, video, or other electronic media for a diagnosis, consultation, or treatment. And then there's also a definition in the current Maine Care Minutes Manual that defines telehealth as interactive, visual, real-time telecommunications. So both of these uh, definitions include the interactive audio video piece, but we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other options as well. We often see these terms telehealth and telemedicine uh, bounced around between different laws and different speakers and different programs. In general, telemedicine was more commonly, commonly used in the past, but telehealth is a more universal term. It covers multiple disciplines, including dentistry, counseling, physical therapy, home health, 
And telehealth also includes the education piece, which we think is very important. We discuss four types of telehealth or telemedicine when we speak about telehealth. The first, probably the most common, is live video conferencing synchronous services. So using webcams like we had on earlier to connect to a patient in real time. The patient could be at a health facility of some kind, a rural clinic, or maybe they're at home. We also look at store and forward services or asynchronous services. So these are services that don't happen in real time. This is sort of the idea that we could take an image, maybe at a primary care's office, and send that image to a specialist. And at a later time, whenever it's most convenient, that specialist could take a look at the image and triage or maybe diagnose. One of the popular methods is teledermatology. So the idea that we can take images of the skin, send it to a dermatologist, and the dermatologist can look at it at 11 o'clock at night when they have some free time and triage and determine if that patient needs to come in immediately for an appointment or not. And Danielle will share a little more about an example in our region. We also look at remote patient monitoring. So the idea that we can send an internet connected scale, blood pressure cuff, those sorts of devices into the patient's home or nursing home. The patient can use those devices on a daily basis. That data is collected and automatically sent to a provider. Maybe there's some sort of algorithm that determines when values are um, of concern and flags those values so a nurse can follow up and determine if the patient needs to come in for follow up. A lot of interest in remote patient monitoring. monitoring. We received quite a few questions, but there's some challenges, uh, most notably around reimbursement um, that folks are still working through. And then we also look at mobile health or mHealth. And mHealth kind of includes all three of these other modalities, and that's the idea of using smartphones or tablets to connect and provide services. Those could be live video services. You could use a smartphone for store and forward to take the image or to send the image. Um, the program Daniel will talk about uses an app on, on a smartphone for that. And then certainly remote patient monitoring devices could be connected to a tablet and the data could be sent through one of those. There are many uses of telehealth. This is not an inclusive list, but anything from behavioral health to wound care and anything in between. Uh, certainly not all clinical services can be provided through telehealth, but there's a lot of uses that can make services or appointments easier for patients. And I thought this was a neat slide. I actually saw APHA this year from a presenter. Um, where is telehealth or where um, can a patient be to receive telehealth? And it, and it really could be anywhere, anywhere that you can connect to the internet or if you have a satellite connection, a medical center, maybe on an airplane or in an airport. There's been some interesting news articles about airlines interested in incorporating telehealth on the airplane, on a boat, um, in the home, on a spaceship, really anywhere that you can make that connection. It, could be a possibility. And then, of course, since we're talking here with the Maine Public Health Association, telehealth and public health, we don't think this topic gets as much interest yet, but we're excited to see how public health continues to look at telehealth and utilizes some of the benefits. Um, this is just a few of the 10 essential public health services that might relate to telehealth, such as monitoring health status, which certainly fits in very well with remote patient monitoring. Um, diagnosing and investigating health problems, informing, educating, and empowering people about their health issues, certainly a great way to connect with patients about health and their, their health, linking people to healthcare, certainly the you know, traditional use of telehealth and still is the, the connection of rural patients to urban medical specialists, um, a great use and very popular, although people are looking at expanding into other areas as well. So a lot of really great uses for public health, I think, and we're excited to see how that continues to expand. These are just some of the benefits of telehealth, and I won't go into these in great detail. Um, some of them um, are very common sense, and some of them may be digging a little deeper. Certainly the one that's talked about most is increased, increased patient access to providers through decreased travel. So the idea that the patient doesn't have to drive to an urban medical center if they live in a rural area, or even if they're in an urban area and transport to the the community health center is a challenge uh, for one reason or the other, either uh, transportation challenges or, or medical necessities that mean that it's hard for them to get around. Um, a lot of great benefits there. And then a number of other benefits. And Danielle will dig into a couple of these in some of the sample programs she will share in a minute. And then, of course, we have to look at some of the challenges for telehealth. There's certainly some barriers that folks are still looking at and considering. 
Uh, startup costs and connection fees for the technology is one of those. As Danielle mentioned, the need for training and workforce development at all levels is something folks are really looking into and, and trying to expand. There can be increased staffing demands in clinics in some instances. Uh, provider pushback is something we look at. Are the providers um, eager to adopt telehealth services? Can they fit it in their workflow? Um, and how does that work for them? And then, of course, as Danielle has alluded to, a slow and confusing legal and regulatory landscape that can make it challenging to start programs, but that's one of the reasons why we think we're here and we can be helpful. And we'll dig into that a little more towards the end of the presentation. But now I will turn it back to Danielle to talk a little bit about what's happening today. Great. Thanks, Andrew. So, as mentioned, there is a lot going on in regard to telehealth, a lot of different um, stakeholders, disciplines, et cetera, very, very interested in, in how we can use it, expand upon it um, to really meet collective aims across all the various um, healthcare organizations, public health organizations, et cetera, um, to increase access to care, improve population health, and decrease costs. I know we're all working on um, those three things. The triple aim is not unfamiliar to, I'm sure, anyone on this webinar today. Um, so just a little bit of overview, Medicare reimbursed a total of $13.9 million in calendar year 2014. That is just a drop in the bucket in regard to the entire budget, but you can see it's a, it's a significant increase um, based on the $61,000, just a little over $61,000 spent in calendar year 2001. So that just shows you, um, you know, the jump that we're seeing. And, uh, I'll be very interested to see the numbers for 2015 uh, when we can get our, our hands on that data. Uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs plans to spend $1.2 billion for telehealth programs in their 2016 budget. They treated over 690,000 veterans through telehealth in the fiscal year 2014. They are doing some phenomenal things uh, and, and our partners um, here in the state of Maine and in the Northeast region uh, can, are very much willing to share information um, and program details uh, through us in particular, but phenomenal things that they're achieving um, through Veterans Affairs. Global telemedicine technology market is estimated to reach $43.4 billion by 2019. That's an annual growth of almost 20%, and that's according to a research for, uh, firm out of uh, Wells Wellesley, Massachusetts. And then there is strong peer-reviewed evidence base um, and many clinical gui guidelines, including those from our friends at the American Telemedicine Association. They certainly are a leader in the field. And you will see if you do some research and or lean on us for some research in regard to any particular program, just like anything else, there are areas that, that their evidence base is stronger and that there are areas that are more um, in the innovation stage. People are trying telehealth as uh, you know, an option to address access barriers, um, funding barriers, et cetera, in just about any way that you can imagine. So um, we're seeing a lot of different ideas and innovations coming through. But of course, you know, as with anything, um, there, there's stronger evidence in particular disciplines and or programs, but building in other areas. So telehealth in the Northeast, because that's where we are. And um, programs and policy are traditionally more active in the northern part of the region. Uh, we have a little bit of a, um, a theory around that. The, the northern part of the region has had um, telehealth parity for, for uh, reimbursement for telehealth services, um, more so in the past, and they're more rural, which is historically where the funding um, has really been driven to, to increase access to, to services for rural folks. So that's um, we feel that's pretty much why uh, the policy has followed that. Increasing interest in home telehealth, absolutely, and Andrew mentioned that a little bit before. Um, reading folks where they're at and, and providing increased access is very important and, and folks are seeing the benefit to that. Increasing interest from private practitioners, uh, many providing behavioral mental health. We're getting a lot of requests in that regard. And then significant policy and regulatory activity. Uh, there were 80 plus bills within our eight state region over this past spring summer and many which moved forward in a positive way in regard to um, opening the doors for more telehealth utilization, reimbursement, etc. So just some 
select models. Again, this is not exhaustive. We have partners out there doing phenomenal things. Uh, these are just some that we pulled together, thinking that they would be of interest to this particular group, uh, and they span our entire region. Uh, we, we're going to talk a little bit about each of the modalities that Andrew mentioned, live video conferencing, storm forward, uh, remote patient monitoring, and of course, mHealth. So these are just the examples that we're going to go through. Um, our, we have some partners within the Finger Lakes Community Health in New York. They are utilizing live video conferencing for pediatric uh, teledentistry. Their Community Migrant Health Center, FQHC, um, which, as you all know, sometimes provoke, uh, you know, poses its own challenges. They have nine sites, and there were around 23,000 patients seen in 2014. We do have contact uh, information for each of those folks, so if you would like more information in regard to any of these programs, please let us know. We'd be happy to set up a video conference with you or connect you via email, etc. cetera. Um, these folks are always willing to share and are phenomenal to work with. Program description, um, just we go over this really quickly. We don't provide a whole lot of information. Again, that's why it's important to um, connect with us if you want to know more. They use point-to-point -point telehealth network to connect clinical peds patients with dental providers in Rochester. Um, and we're going to share a little bit about their outcomes. That Those are actual, uh, the, the doc is, um, or the dentist is the gentleman on the left on your screen, and then, of course, the um, the originating site or the patient site is at the right with the patient and family and the provider there. So what's their business model? How do they get paid? They have um, public, they utilize reimbursement for both public and private payers, managed care, um, return on investment via improved patient outcomes. So they, you know, they look a little bit outside the box with this particular model. You know, they might not get reimbursed to the full extent that they would wish but they see huge return on investment with, with uh, patients following through with their full treatment plan, et cetera, um, and it really is a payoff, and, and they get reimbursed better overall because they're meeting their quality indicators. And they also have uh, several grants because they have really established themselves as a leader in telehealth programming uh, throughout the region, so they've been very successful in that realm as well. Their implementation approach, their goal is really to increase access to dental screenings and treatment for high-risk pediatric patients. And what are some of their primary outcomes are decreased travel time for patients and families, and as well as their uh, community health liaisons. Their treatment and follow-up compliance rates are greater than 90%. As I mentioned, they're phenomenal. And of course, improved patient outcomes. So telemental health is another well-established utilization of uh, live video conferencing. Uh, for telehealth, we have a partner that we've worked with for the last several months to help them develop um, a, a roadmap for s establishing a school-based telepsychiatry program within their school that utilizes local be uh, behavioral mental health providers to increase access to timely and, uh, and appropriate care for their students with those needs. So Athol Hospital, Haywood Healthcare, in Massachusetts, Athol is a critical access nonprofit acute care hospital. They serve nine communities in the North Quabbin region. If you, those of you who are familiar, that's a very rural area. Um, we do have some, some contacts for you there. Dr. Rebecca Balecki is, is the primary contact there. Uh, program description, they are a collaborative program with the Athol Royalston Regional School District and clinical and support options. They are the local t um, mental health provider, connecting students and pediatric psychiatrists uh, via high-definition video conferencing. Um, and they just went live within the past month or so, so uh, very exciting. And that's a picture of their program. Their business model, they actually received a HRSA network development grant. They have contracts with the local providers for payment. And they, Massachusetts does not currently have a telehealth parity reimbursement law on the books, but they are very much working with uh, other stakeholders throughout the state to help establish that. Um, so they're working, you know, forward to, to, to help it establish that reimbursement piece. The implementation, their goal really, of course, is to increase access to child psychiatry services for treatment uh, and, and medication management, which is a, a huge challenge for folks all over this region in the United States, frankly, to, to have access to that, those providers. Their anticipated outcomes, because they just launched, as mentioned, is decreased travel time for students and families, decreased lost work time. This one's a biggie, less disruption for these students um, in their routines, which, you know, in regard to student um, 
schedules is, is a very big deal. Um, increased access to psychiatric services leading to appropriate medication management and improved patient outcomes. Then um, this is a main-based program that's been around for several years, uh, video relay interpretation. Uh, this comes out of the Pine Tree Society in Maine. They're a nonprofit established in 1936. Uh, they began providing um, services, and then the interpretive services came in 1976. Their director is Douglas Newton, um, great guy to work with if, if you have interest in um, VRI. Program description setup, they leverage existing infrastructure of sign language emergency response system that's all over the, the state at this point, and they have um, moved to a cloud-based technology to deliver live video remote interpreting, or VRI. It's encrypted uh, and can also use mobile devices. And that's just a picture of someone providing that service. They're, they started out with a grant, and now they are receiving reimbursement, reimbursement uh, for their services. Implementation approach, uh, of course, their goal is to facil facilitate communication between two people at the same site who do not use the same language, in this case, American Sign Language. And their outcomes are patients access medical services in their local community. They foster patient-provider relationships and improved quality of communication, uh, increasing fund of knowledge and compliance with medical advice. So that's what we have, and again, there are many other live video conferencing um, programs out there, but I wanted to share, as men Andrew mentioned earlier, our store and forward teledermatology, our partners at the University of Vermont Medical Center, and one of our physician leaders, uh, Dr. Julie Lin, has been working on piloting teledermatology throughout um, the state and among several FQHCs for the past couple of years. Um, and has had phenomenal results. Their program is, re is really wonderful in regard that it uses a free um, access derm application. It's HIPAA compliant. It was actually developed by the American Academy of Dermatology, so it's well vetted um, with standards, et cetera, built into it. And it really is meant to facilitate referrals from primary care providers for remote dermatology consults using mobile devices and the internet. Um, store, store and forward, and Andrew is not joking when he said, you know, the providers look at these images at 11 o'clock at night. I know Dr. Lynn has mentioned she's done that many a time. Um, if you've ever tried to get a dermatology appointment here in the state of Maine or anywhere within our region, it's months. They are, um, it's, a, it's a tough appointment to get, and uh, dermatolo teledermatology has um, created some outcomes um, to help address that, which you'll see in just a second. This is just a picture of the, the flow that they use. I thought that was interesting to share with folks. Um, but really wanted to get to um, their outcomes, their business model. As, as uh, Dr. Lynn would mention, spotty reimbursement. They've applied for a telehealth pilot fund through the Vermont, Vermont um, Innovation Grant. They are still waiting to hear on that, uh, and we're very hopeful that they get that. Uh, but for store and forward, as a rule, the, the reimbursement policy across any of the states is spotty. Um, folks have had a hard time getting that incorporated into their, their reimbursement policy. Implementation approach, of course, they want to increase access to dermatology through, throughout Vermont. Uh, there are currently only 20 st uh, derms statewide, but they know that you know, decreased melanoma mortality occurs um, even with one versus 100,000, one dermatologist per 100,000 population versus not having it all any at all. Uh, their outcomes post-implementation for the pilot, there were 44 store and forward consults, average response time was 9.2 hours, and the average wait time for appointments was 12.9 days versus 60.2 days, almost 80% reduction, which is huge when you're talking about a potential um, malignant um, occurrence. So. And that's just a picture. I mean, how cool is that? A little scope goes right on their, their iPhone or their, their um, smartphone. So I think I'm going to zip through um, RPM very quickly just so I can get Andrew a chance to talk about reimbursement because that's a very common question. Um, remote patient monitoring is occurring everywhere. There's a lot more interest in it. It historically doesn't ha hasn't had as much reimbursement, but folks are really looking toward this. Uh, the model that we wanted to share is, again, here out of Maine, Home Health Visiting Nurses of Maine treats medically fragile patients. Um, they are a fully licensed nonprofit provider of home health, 
seeing folks 24-7 throughout the three counties they cover, PT, OT, speech, nursing, et cetera. Um, you know, Milfoy is a wonderful contact there. Um, they use 4G tablets with preloaded software and peripherals at the patient home. They provide real-time patient data algorithms, as Andrew mentioned, um, that highlight patients at, at risk for readmission. They empower patients to change the behaviors in view of the medical condition. Uh, this is just a, a show of, um, you know, the, the app covers, you know, there's the provider piece to it, then there's the, the patient, and then there's even a caregiver uh, piece to the application that really helps people to connect and encourage that, that continuity of care. Their business model has been primarily grants, public and private payer reimbursement, and contracts. Um, implementation approach, their goal to, obviously is to expand access to care and improve quality measures for elders with adverse chronic disease um, by using this technology. Their outcomes, um, just for this particular period of time, because these um, home health visiting nurses has been doing this for many years, they served 275 patients um, between March and August of 2015, uh, primarily um, chronic heart failure, COPD, and diabetes. Their patient adherence is 74.5 to 77%, which is quite remarkable. Um, improved clinical outcomes, most certainly increased patient satisfaction. Um, and then reduced hospital readmission, which is a huge uh, outcome. And then M Health, very, very quickly, um, this is a model out of uh, Partners Healthcare Connected Health in Massachusetts. Um, the contact is Paula McCree. Their program really um, is quite simple and is beautiful in its simplicity. In collaboration with community health centers, they use simple texting to communicate with at-risk pregnant women. These are primarily adolescents, teens, young, young women. Um, sending between one and four text messages per week throughout the pregnancy and two months postpartum with reminders on, you know, all of the different pieces of um, prenatal care that can be overwhelming. Um, this is just a picture of somebody utilizing that app. They are funded internally um, in this particular case. They, uh, their goal is to improve prenatal health in underserved communities and the outcomes so far are women who receive text messages from their clinical team receive recommended level of prenatal care. 9% more than other pregnant women who did not, and the patients in the text message group reported they would re recommend it to other pregnant women. So that was a very, very quick overview of, of some great programs. We have many more, um, so please check in with us if you're interested, but I'm going to uh, turn it over to Andrew again to chat about uh, telehealth policy. So we, we've almost, almost hit 1045, but I just want to take a, a minute here or two to talk about telehealth policy and reimbursement. Um, it's certainly a policy is a major driver in telehealth programs. There are a lot of issues that we look at, anything from reimbursement to uh, professional standards, licensing requirements. You need a license in the state where the patient is located at the time of service. Um, internet prescribing issues. Can you prescribe medication without seeing the person physically in person? Or if you see them face to face through a live interactive telehealth encounter, is that sufficient to establish a physician patient or provider patient relationship? And then, if you're a physician, can you prescribe medication after that? HIPAA requirements, what is, re what is required of the technology um, to meet HIPAA? And then certainly malpractice liability, are you covered if you're providing services through telehealth and depending on where the patient is located? Reimbursement is one of our most common questions, as Danielle mentioned. And as Danielle alluded to, it really depends on the state and the payer. Um, of course, Medicare has the national policy and it has some very specific and I would say limiting requirements. Most notably, the patient needs to be located in a rural health care facility and they have a specific definition for rural. And we're happy to um, provide resources if you have more questions about that. There's also a great handout on our homepage at metric.org for Medicare telehealth services that outlines all of their requirements. Uh, Medicaid programs vary uh, greatly between what they will cover if they cover live video. And then certainly much fewer, fewer programs will cover store and forward or remote patient monitoring. And then private payers, 29 states and Washington, D.C. have passed laws requiring private payers to reimburse for telehealth. But those, law, those laws vary on what sort of modalities they cover. Um, reimbursement should, I would say, be equal to in-person services, but not always. Um, a law passed in Delaware recently actually left that out and, and said in the law that it's up to negotiation to allow um, that uh, the patient or the, the provider negotiate with the insurer determine, to determine what the payment rate is as a way to achieve cost savings. 
Um, so there's some debate around that, but certainly some opportunities. And a lot of opportunity in Maine. In 2009, Maine passed a private payer parity law that mandates coverage of live audio and video. It does not specifically mention store and forward or remote patient monitoring, but it doesn't exclude it either. And I would say that this language covers or includes coverage parity, so it requires private payers to coverage services um, provided via telehealth, but it doesn't necessarily mention payment parity, so they don't necessarily have to pay at the same rate as in person, but we certainly hope they do. And unlike Medicare, the main private parity law doesn't specify any eligible, eligible providers or require the patient to be at any eligible sites. Some of these laws passed in other states will be very specific on what sites the payer has to cover. Certainly they could go ab above and beyond, but sometimes they're only required to reimburse if the patient is at a healthcare facility or for only specific provider types. And then Maine Care has had a policy for many years. The current policy requires a approval, pre-approval once a year um, that de demonstrates a compelling benefit to use live video. They also have a remote patient monitoring policy and they do not currently cover store and forward. But all of this is changing quickly. Main Care did release proposed rules on November 10th and comments are due by November 17th that among other things removes the current pre-approval process for live video services. Um, they say that it allows for all medically necessary services that can be delivered remotely at comparable quality. They, they have also added an originating site fee. So in the Medicare policies, they will reimburse the originating site, so that's the site of the patient, for $25.10 for the 2016 calendar year um, for providing that encounter, the technology, uh, maybe having a telepresenter. It's supposed to cover those sorts of services provided at the patient site. Some Medicaid programs are reimbursing for that service too. And in this proposed rule, Maine Care will begin doing that. They also mentioned that um, they expect it to be visual and audio services, so the live video. But if live video is not available, um, they've included telephonic services. They mentioned a few things about HIPAA compliant equipment and uh, member choice, um, that Main Care will reimburse the member if they prefer to travel. Um, they require written informed consent and member education. This policy also outlines telemonitoring services provided by home care agencies only, home health care agencies. So if you're interested in taking a look at this policy, below is their website, uh, the, the link for main.gov. Comments are due by November 17th, uh, and we, or December 17th, sorry, and we strongly urge you to uh, take a look at that and submit your comments. A few resources to highlight. Certainly we encourage you to check out our website, netric.org. We also have a National Telehealth Resource Center website with our consortium of 14 telehealth resource centers. Um, as Danielle mentioned, the Center for Connect Health Policy, our Technology Assessment Center, the American Telemedicine Association, and then the Center for Telehealth and eHealth Law have a lot of great resources. And certainly a lot of great programs around the region willing to share. And also one final note, tomorrow at noon, Danielle and I will be joining Maine Health and Acadia Hospital for a webinar. Um, expanding on a little bit of what we've talked today and telehealth in Maine. Maine Health will talk a little bit about their current telestroke program and Acadia will join us to talk about telemental health and some other things they're working on. And if you're interested in finding that link, Maine Quality Counts has a webinar section on their website where you can register for that. And for those interested, I'll actually um, be sharing details from Maine Seacoast Missions um, primary care telehealth program. They've been using it for quite some time. We were really hoping to get uh, their director, Sharon Daly, uh, to be able to do the webinar with us, but she was very nervous about um, it. It's such a great program, um, but she may arrive on site and there may be a lobster boat in their way or a skiff or the tide might not cooperate, you know, in regard to, there's just so many pieces. So she has given us permission most graciously to share um, those details on her behalf. So that webinar will also be focused on the Maine Seacoast Mission and the great program they have there. So as Andrew mentioned, our contact information is here. I'm actually going to turn our camera back on. I'm not seeing any specific questions in the chat at this time. But we are open to questions.
Um, hi, Danielle. It's Tina. Um, I, I do see some people with their hands raised. So um, let's see. Uh, oh, okay. We have a guy. I see a couple of questions. One was just how do we obtain a copy of this PowerPoint slide deck? Um, Randy, thanks for that question. Uh, we will. We have recorded this webinar, and I will post this online. Uh, I'm happy to send you a cop a link to that. Uh, I don't know Danielle and Andrew if you're also willing to provide the actual slide deck, I'll let you answer that. Sure, yes, we will. Uh, we received permission from all of our partners who we've included in the slide deck, so, and all of the photos um, that are used as well. So, yep, we're, we're happy to share that. Okay. Um, we also had another question about the $25.10 originating site fee. Is that the same across the nation, or does it vary from state to state? So for Medicare, it's the same across the nation. I, I assume Maine Care will use the same rate. But they don't describe that in their policy. Yeah. And again, these are proposed rules. We're, we are very hopeful that they go through. Um, and if you have any comments, any questions, please, we encourage you to submit them before uh, or by December 17th. It's been a very collaborative process to date um, with Maine Care taking the lead. And it's really um, going to open up the, the, the coverage and the policy here in the state of Maine. So, and then I had I had a question about that. So I'm assuming that um, the originating I mean not the I I didn't want to talk about the site fee, but I had a question just about this is this is potential for any kind of provider I'm assuming across the board, any physician provider or does this also um, move to um, nurse practitioners and other providers and are there any are there any um, constraints in terms of providers? And Certainly as far as the, the clinical services go, you're just restrained by your scope of practice. And then reimbursement, it varies. Um, Medicare does have a list, and it's a fairly inclusive list of provider types that are eligible. Some of the state laws for private payers have specific lists, and generally those are very, fairly inclusive as well. Main care doesn't specify one way or the other. Or I mean, I'm sorry, the main law doesn't specify one, one way or the other. And then most Medicaid programs are fairly inclusive as well, as long as you stay within your scope of practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, Peter Mishu, are you, uh, I'm going to un, oops, I think I'm going to unmute you. I'm going to try to unmute you. It looks like you have your hand up. Um, Peter, I just, I just unmuted you. So if you have a question, uh, you should be able to ask it now. Thanks, Tina. I was just having a problem with the sound at that time cutting oh, out. So okay. I, I, long I long ago. Hopefully, it didn't cut out for long. Not very long. All right. I'm gonna un, I'm gonna put you back on mute then, Peter. <laughs> um, I'm looking for other hands raised. Um, I think we answered the questions that are. In, well, we had a, a, I think more, I guess it's a question, um, uh, but I won't even use his last name, but Mark wants to know, he says you both are naturally good looking or do you try extra hard on webinar days? <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> I, I'm going to assume that Mark was talking about you and I, Danielle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was effect, no filter for those days. <laughs> <laughs> that was very nice. Thank you. <laughs> uh, oh, Randy had another question. Um, how many states are allowing Teladerm? So, so store and forward, um, teledermatology is definitely one of the more common. Um, it, there's a lot of interest and more programs popping up in regard to utilization for store and forward for. Uh, screening for diabetic retinopathy. So as, as those occur, we're, we're getting more and more um, interest in information and would love to share that with folks who are interested in using that particular modality. It's still quite limited. I, Andrew, it's nine states that currently on the books have um, that cover store and forward. For Medicaid. I, I think for it's Medicaid, nine yes. States. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, we haven't seen more, but certainly there's a lot of great evidence and it's growing. So I, we hope that that will continue to move in a positive direction. Um, Medicare 
doesn't include it in their global policy or their national policy, I guess. Um, but they have been doing demonstration programs in Alaska and Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully that leads to some more reimbursement for store and forward from them. Yep. And the private payers, as Andrew mentioned, they may not specifically include that language in um, the law. So it leaves a little bit of wiggle room for, in, for inconsistency, frankly, uh, whether they're going to cover it or not. Some are covering, some payers are covering, and some are not. Um, so it's really about going to that particular payer and determining whether they're covering it at this time. Yeah. One of the challenges we have seen as far as reimbursement from private payers, a lot of the laws will say that they need to reimburse for whatever is provided in, in person if it's provided via telehealth. And then the question gets to, are they really paying for store and forward services in person? Uh, no. And are they paying for remote patient monitoring services in person? No. So then how, do, how does that law and the, how does the language in the law, um, how is it phrased in a way that it would include those services? And that's kind of a challenge still. Yeah. And what's kind of frustrating, is you think about radiology, it's telehealth. It's telemedicine. And it's no one's ever questioned it. It's been around forever, and that's the, del the delivery mechanism. Um, but it kind of flies under the radar in respect to that. Uh, it's not called teleradiology, it's just radiology, and people use it every single day um, very effectively. So uh, we're hoping to get there but with other utilizations of storm forward uh, applications because it really is proving to be quite helpful, it, especially, you know, dermatology, for example, it really helps them to prioritize their patient list and say, okay, I really do need to see these five patients because they have a potential malignancy um, versus these other folks, which I can quickly look at it and, and manage with their primary care doc because that's a rash kind of thing um, and really shorten those wait times. So, yeah, great question. Uh, we had a, another question from uh, Joe Robinson asking about palliative care. Are there, is there, what's happening with telehealth and palliative care in Maine? Want to talk a little bit about cancer and <clears throat> yeah, so um, thank you for your question, Joe. We we have a great bibliography that we're happy to share with folks around um, telehealth services for cancer, and certainly some great uses there around as it relates to palliative care. A uh, couple of webinars we did recently, uh, one with a, a physician at the University of Vermont, and then our colleagues at the um, Southwest Telehealth Resource Center and the University of Arizona program presented on it a little bit. We haven't heard a lot about programs in Maine actively getting involved for palliative care, um, but a lot of great potential, and we're excited to see how it might grow. Mm -hmm. You think about there are there are telestroke programs here, which Andrew mentioned yesterday. Uh, tomorrow um, in our Maine Quality Counts webinar, we're going to have folks from the Maine Health Telestroke Program, and they very much used it in an acute fashion to to diagnose that stroke. Um, be a connection of a, with a neurologist and whether they um, get thrombolytics for that stroke, et cetera. Um, but there's a huge possibility there for utilizing those services moving forward. As you know, if there's a considerable deficit from that stroke, that there, there's a long um, process of rehabilitation and we have some great resources in the state in, in that regard. Um, but tel telehealth could be a great way to save patients time and, and increase access um, in regard to travel and accessing those providers over those months to come. Um, so there, there's a lot of potential for palliative care um, utilizations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think we're, we're just about at the end of our time. Um, everyone has Danielle and Andrew's contact information there on the slide. And I, I think I can speak for you both when I say that I know you're, you're happy to answer any questions at any time. I think the information has, has just been wonderful and very valuable. I have, I think, a couple of follow-up questions actually, but I will save those for I will save those for another time. Danielle, I'm wondering if you can flip to the next slide since you have control. You I just wanted to let everyone know about uh, the net. Oh, it's not showing up on my screen, but there's um, that. There, I mean, it is that the green slide showing up, but the text isn't showing up at the bottom. But anyhow, we do have another webinar. This is the second in our series. We're having um, 
We're having six different webinars on various topics, and I just want to let folks know that the next webinar is January 6th. It's on marijuana policy and what we can learn from other states. Uh, we're lucky enough to have Scott Gagnon, um, who's going to be presenting for us, <clears throat> who is now a nationally known expert on marijuana policy, and we're, we're talking about recreational use. So we'd love to have folks join us for that. Um, then I just want to thank Andrew and Danielle one more time. I really appreciate all of your time and effort and the expertise you bring, um, not only to us at MPHA, but to everyone throughout the state in New England. We, um, we appreciate it and um, look forward to, to hearing what, what's going to come down the pike with telehealth. Well, thank you so much to all of you. Thank you, Tina, for having us. And we uh, very much look forward to working with all of you.